For three millennia, the galaxy had known nothing but peace. The Galactic Council, a coalition of ancient species that had ruled with diplomacy and trade, had maintained this fragile harmony. War was a distant memory, something that had been relegated to history books and cautionary tales. Civilizations flourished under the Council's oversight, and even the most contentious disputes were settled without bloodshed. It was an era that most believed would last forever. But humanity had changed everything. There were newcomers to the galactic scene, arriving with an intensity and drive that unsettled the more established species. The humans had appeared out of nowhere, spreading quickly, their ships probing deeper into the galaxy's farthest reaches. They were explorers, traders, and colonizers, but there was something about their ambition that the Council couldn't ignore. Despite their relative youth, humanity had developed technology at an alarming rate. They expanded faster than any species before them, adapting to new environments and establishing colonies and systems long ignored by others. At first, the Council had welcomed humanity's presence, seeing them as potential allies in their ever-growing network of interstellar civilizations. But as the humans continued to push their boundaries, ignoring the traditional protocols of the Council, it became clear that they were not content to simply follow the rules. Where other species respected the borders drawn by centuries of diplomacy, humans viewed them as obstacles to be overcome. Whispers of concern spread through the Council. Meetings that were once filled with talk of trade agreements and cultural exchanges now buzzed with hushed conversations about humanity's intentions. Their colonization efforts, their bold technological advancements, everything pointed to a species that was unwilling to conform. Some council members, particularly those from the more conservative factions, began to see humanity not as a partner, but as a threat. The tipping point came when humanity laid claim to a star system that had long been considered neutral territory. It was a small system, unremarkable by galactic standards, but its strategic position made it a key location for trade routes and military oversight. For centuries, the Council had kept the system untouched, a buffer zone between the more powerful factions. But in one bold move, humanity had sent ships into the system, declaring it their own and establishing a colony almost overnight. Outrage rippled through the Council chambers. Diplomats from the older, more established species demanded an explanation, but humanity's response was simple. They needed the system for their expansion, and they weren't willing to back down. This defiance was unlike anything the Council had ever faced. In the past, even the most aggressive species had always respected the Council's authority. But the humans weren't like the others. They didn't care about the ancient treaties or the balance of power that had kept the galaxy in check for so long. Debates within the Council quickly escalated. Some argued that humanity's actions could still be curbed through diplomacy. They believed that with the right incentives, the humans could be brought into line, made to understand the importance of maintaining the peace that had lasted for millennia. But others, particularly those who had felt their influence wane as humanity rose, saw no room for negotiation. To them, humanity's defiance was a direct challenge to the Council's authority, one that could not go unanswered. The discussions grew heated. Accusations were thrown across the council floor, with some species accusing the humans of harboring imperial ambitions. They pointed to humanity's rapid technological progress, their expansionist tendencies, and their refusal to adhere to the council's long-standing protocols. The more paranoid factions painted a picture of humanity as a species on the verge of becoming a galactic superpower, one that could destabilize the delicate balance of power the council had worked so hard to maintain. Weeks passed, and tensions continued to rise. Diplomatic missions were sent to negotiate with humanity, but each one returned with the same message, humanity would not withdraw from the system. They were willing to engage in trade and cooperation, but they would not abandon what they had claimed. For the Council, this was unacceptable. Humanity's actions weren't just about one star system, they were a symbol of something larger. If humanity could get away with this, what else would they try to take? The more aggressive factions began to push for military action. It was a shocking suggestion. The Council hadn't mobilized for war in over 3,000 years. The idea of open conflict was something that many species had forgotten how to even contemplate. 
but the hawks within the council insisted that it was the only way to stop humanity before they became too powerful. War, they argued, was a necessary evil. It would send a message to the humans, and to any other species that might be watching, that the council was still in control. As the debates dragged on, it became clear that a decision had to be made. The council's authority was at stake. If they allowed humanity to continue its unchecked expansion, it would undermine everything they had built over the centuries. And so, in a move that shocked even the most cynical observers, the council voted to break the 3,000-year peace and declare war on humanity. The announcement reverberated across the galaxy. For many, the news was unbelievable. Entire generations had lived and died without ever knowing the horrors of war. Civilizations that had long considered violence a thing of the past suddenly found themselves questioning the future. The Council's decision sent shockwaves through the galactic community, with many species wondering if this was truly the end of an era. But for humanity, the declaration of war was not unexpected. They had seen the writing on the wall for some time. Their leadership had prepared for this moment, knowing that their rapid rise would eventually provoke the ire of the Council. While other species panicked at the thought of war, humanity stood firm. This wasn't the first time they had faced an existential threat. Earth's history was littered with conflicts, each one forging a species that thrived in adversity. When the Council's ultimatum arrived, demanding that humanity relinquish the disputed system and cease its expansion, the response was swift and direct. Humanity would not back down. They would defend their colonies, their people, and their right to exist on their own terms. The Council's declaration of war was not met with fear or hesitation, it was met with resolve. As the first fleets began to mobilize, humanity prepared for what was to come. They knew they were outnumbered, that the Council's forces were vast and powerful. But they also knew that they were fighting for something far more important than territory or power. They were fighting for their place in the galaxy, for their right to carve out their own destiny. The war had begun, and there was no turning back. For the first time in thirty hundred years, the galaxy would know the sound of battle once more. Humanity had always been adaptable, resilient in ways that even they couldn't fully explain. They had come from a planet where survival often meant confronting the unexpected, enduring the harsh, and rising from impossible odds. So when the Galactic Council declared war, the response from humanity was not panic but preparation. This wasn't the first time their species had faced overwhelming odds, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. The declaration of war was met with cold resolve. In the highest chambers of human leadership, political and military minds came together, understanding the gravity of the situation. This wasn't just about defending a colony or a disputed star system. It was a war for survival, one that would determine humanity's place in the galaxy for generations to come and humanity knew exactly what was at stake. We knew this day would come, one of the senior military advisors stated grimly as they convened for the emergency meeting. The room was filled with somber faces, but none were surprised. The Council's fear of humanity's rise had been simmering for years. This war had been inevitable from the moment humans began expanding beyond their homeworld, and now that inevitability was staring them in the face. But fear was not part of the equation. Humanity had built its entire civilization on the principle of perseverance. From the darkest moments of their history, they had learned that survival required more than brute strength. It demanded creativity, strategy, and most of all, unity. So as the war loomed, the message sent out to every colony, outpost, and settlement was clear. Prepare for total war. Humanity's leaders wasted no time. The military was mobilized on an unprecedented scale, with ships, soldiers, and resources redirected from peaceful operations to the war effort. Unlike the Council, whose forces were vast but slow to react, humanity moved with speed and precision. Orders were issued across all human-controlled territories, and soon, fleets were moving into position, defensive installations were fortified, and ground forces prepared for the inevitable clash. The strategy was simple, strike fast and strike hard. They knew they couldn't match the Council's numbers head-on, but numbers weren't everything. Humanity's advantage lay in their adaptability, 
and willingness to take risks. While the Council relied on centuries of rigid military doctrine, humans had developed a more flexible approach to combat. They weren't bound by tradition or the expectations of the galaxy's older species. Instead, they embraced chaos, and in war, chaos was a powerful weapon. Military strategists began formulating plans that played to humanity's strengths. The council forces were large and slow, their fleets designed for overwhelming shows of force. But those very qualities made them vulnerable to rapid, guerrilla-style tactics. Humanity's ships, smaller and faster, could outmaneuver the council's lumbering armadas. They would hit and run, striking vulnerable supply lines, targeting isolated ships, and retreating before the council could mount a proper defense. Humanity had never fought a war on this scale before, but they didn't need centuries of experience to know how to fight. Their entire existence had been a series of challenges, each one more daunting than the last. Every human, from the soldiers on the front lines to the scientists developing new technologies, understood that they were fighting for the survival of their species. On the scientific front, humanity's brightest minds were hard at work, developing new technologies to give them an edge in the coming conflict. Weapon systems were upgraded, shields were improved, and new energy sources were tapped to power the war machines that would soon be unleashed. The human war effort was unlike anything the galaxy had ever seen, a species united by the knowledge that they could not afford to lose. But this wasn't just about technology or military might. Humanity's greatest strength was its ability to adapt on the fly. While the Council's forces were massive and well-organized, they lacked the flexibility that human commanders brought to the table. Humans were unpredictable, willing to change strategies mid-battle if it meant gaining the upper hand. They understood that wars weren't won by following the rules, they were won by rewriting them. As fleets were readied and soldiers prepared for battle, humanity also began forging alliances with the smaller, more neutral species in the galaxy. These species, though not directly involved in the war, had no love for the Council and were wary of its growing power. They had seen what the Council's bureaucratic control had done to their own worlds, and many were sympathetic to humanity's cause. Quietly, they began offering support, resources, intelligence, even covert assistance in some cases. The Council might have declared war, but humanity wasn't entirely alone. In the weeks following the Council's declaration, humanity transformed itself from a species focused on exploration and expansion to a war machine ready to defend its place in the galaxy. The message to every human colony was clear. This wasn't a war of conquest, but of survival and humanity would fight with everything they had. Across the galaxy, the declaration of war sent shockwaves through every corner of civilization. Many species, unaccustomed to the idea of conflict after thirty hundred years of peace, were unsure how to react. Some feared that humanity's aggression would lead to the collapse of the galactic order, while others began to question the Council's decision. The Council had been the steward of peace for millennia, but was it right to break that peace in such a drastic way? For humanity, these concerns were secondary. They were focused solely on the fight ahead. Their leaders knew that the war would be long and brutal, but they also knew that they had something the council couldn't match, an unshakable resolve. They had faced extinction before, and each time they had emerged stronger. This war would be no different. In the command centers across Earth and the other human colonies, Military officers reviewed the latest intelligence. The Council's fleets were massive, their ships bristling with weapons designed to overwhelm and subdue. But humanity wasn't intimidated. They knew that while the Council might have the numbers, they lacked the speed and flexibility to deal with the kind of war humanity was planning to fight. Let them come, one general said, staring at the tactical display of Council forces massing at the border of human controlled space. They won't know what hit them. The galaxy might not have seen war in thousands of years, but humanity hadn't forgotten how to fight. Their military might have been smaller than the Council's, but it was built on principles of survival, not just dominance. Every human soldier, every ship, every weapon was designed with one purpose in mind, ensuring the continued existence of their species. And when it came to that, humanity was unmatched. As preparations continued, there was a strange sense of calm that settled over human space. 
This was their moment, their chance to prove that they belonged in the galaxy, not as a subordinate species but as equals. The council had underestimated them from the start, thinking that their youth and lack of history made them weak. But humanity had never relied on history or tradition to define itself. They were a species that forged its own path, one battle at a time. The war had not yet begun in earnest, but humanity was ready. Their ships were in position, their soldiers trained and waiting for the call. The council might have declared war, but humanity had prepared for this moment long before the first shot was fired. Every man, woman, and child knew what was at stake, and they were ready to face whatever came next. For the first time in millennia, the galaxy was on the brink of war, and humanity, as always, stood ready to survive. The war began with the Council's fleets moving slowly but deliberately toward the edges of human space. Massive ships, bristling with weapons and defensive systems, cast long shadows over the stars. The Council had assumed that a show of overwhelming force would intimidate humanity into retreat or, at the very least, slow their expansion. They were wrong. Humanity's response came swiftly and without hesitation. In the first days of the conflict, they didn't wait for the Council's forces to reach their colonies. Instead, human ships launched a series of rapid strikes against the approaching fleets. These weren't large-scale battles but precision attacks, fast, brutal, and highly effective. Human ships, smaller and more maneuverable than the massive Council vessels, darted in and out of the Council's formations, hitting key targets before disappearing into the void. The Council had not anticipated this. Their fleets were designed for prolonged engagements, battles of attrition where their superior numbers and firepower would wear down any opposition. But humanity didn't fight that way. They had learned through centuries of survival that speed, adaptability, and unpredictability were far more effective than brute strength. Their ships, equipped with advanced cloaking and stealth technologies, appeared and vanished like phantoms, leaving the Council's lumbering fleets scrambling to react. In one of the early engagements, a human strike force targeted a Council supply convoy. The convoy, heavily guarded by warships, was essential to the Council's strategy, providing fuel, food, and weapons to the advancing fleet. Humanity knew that cutting off these supplies would cripple the Council's ability to sustain their invasion. Under the cover of darkness, human ships moved in. Using cloaking technology, they bypassed the Council's defenses launching a series of attacks that left the convoy in flames. When the Council warships finally reacted, the humans had already disappeared, leaving behind nothing but wreckage. The attacks sent shockwaves through the Council's command structure. The loss of the convoy wasn't just a logistical setback, it was a humiliation. The Council had expected to steamroll over humanity with overwhelming force, but instead, they found themselves playing defense. Their ships, large and slow, were ill-equipped to deal with the guerrilla-style tactics humanity employed. And while the Council's numbers were vast, their bureaucracy made it difficult for them to adapt to this new kind of warfare. Humanity's strategy was simple but devastatingly effective. They knew they couldn't face the Council head-on in large-scale battles, not yet at least. But by targeting supply lines, communication hubs, and isolated fleets, they could chip away at the Council's strength slowly eroding their ability to maintain a cohesive war effort. Every time the Council tried to regroup or mount an offensive, they found themselves one step behind, reacting to humanity's unpredictable strikes. The Council commanders, frustrated by their inability to corner the human fleets, began deploying more forces to key strategic points, hoping to anticipate the next attack. But this only played into humanity's hands. With their forces spread thin, the Council became even more vulnerable. Human intelligence agents, working alongside military strategists, identified weak points in the Council's defenses, sending strike teams to dismantle their operations with surgical precision. The galaxy had not seen war in over 3,000 years, and it quickly became apparent that the Council's forces were not equipped to handle the chaos humanity brought to the battlefield. Their rigid tactics, designed for traditional, large-scale conflicts, were no match for the fluid, ever-changing strategies humanity employed. Every time the Council thought they had humanity cornered, the humans would shift their tactics, striking in ways the Council had never expected. 
On the ground, humanity's soldiers proved just as resourceful. When the council finally landed troops on a human colony, expecting to overrun the settlement with ease, they were met with fierce resistance. Human forces, smaller in number but far more adaptable, used the terrain to their advantage, setting traps, conducting hit-and-run attacks, and outmaneuvering the larger, slower council forces. The council's ground commanders, who had been trained to fight and set formations with heavy reliance on technology, found themselves outclassed by human soldiers who thrived on improvisation and ingenuity. In one of the more significant battles on the planet Tyrus, a council army landed with the intent of capturing the colony's capital. Their ships, bristling with advanced weaponry, hovered in the atmosphere, ready to rain destruction down on the human defenders. But instead of meeting the council head-on, the humans evacuated the city, luring the council troops into a series of ambushes in the surrounding forests. Using guerrilla tactics, the human forces picked off the council soldiers one by one, targeting their commanders and disrupting their communications. By the time the council realized they had walked into a trap, it was too late. Their forces, scattered and disorganized, were unable to regroup. Human forces struck hard and fast, exploiting every weakness, and by the end of the day, the council's army was in full retreat. The battle for Tyrus became a symbol of humanity's resilience and ingenuity, proof that they could hold their own against the galaxy's most powerful military force. The council, once confident in their ability to crush humanity, began to realize that this war would not be won easily. They had underestimated their enemy, and now they were paying the price. But rather than backing down, the council doubled their efforts. They began deploying even more ships, more soldiers, determined to overwhelm humanity by sheer force of numbers. But humanity had prepared for this too. They knew that the council would try to escalate the war, and they were ready. In secret, human scientists had been developing new technologies, weapons that could turn the tide of battle even further in their favor. One of these technologies was an advanced form of energy shielding, capable of withstanding the council's most powerful weapons. When deployed on their ships, these shields made humanity's fleets nearly impervious to the council's attacks, allowing them to strike with even greater impunity. In addition to their technological advancements, humanity's alliances with neutral species began to bear fruit. While the Council had declared war, not every species in the galaxy was eager to see humanity fall. Many smaller civilizations, long resentful of the Council's dominance, began quietly providing humanity with resources and intelligence. These species had seen the Council's arrogance firsthand, and they sympathized with humanity's desire for independence. Though they didn't openly join the war, their support helped tip the scales in humanity's favor. As the weeks turned into months, the Council's frustration grew. Their forces, though vast, were being systematically dismantled. Every engagement with humanity ended in losses, if not in ships or soldiers, then in time and morale. The Council's commanders, used to fighting wars of attrition where their overwhelming numbers would eventually secure victory, found themselves unable to keep up with humanity's relentless pace. Humanity, meanwhile, continued to adapt and evolve. Their tactics became more refined, their technologies more advanced. Every battle taught them something new, every victory strengthened their resolve. They knew they couldn't let up, not for a moment. The Council's war machine was massive, and even a moment of complacency could turn the tide. But humanity had no intention of slowing down. They had faced the Council's might, and they had survived. Now they were on the offensive, determined to show the galaxy that they would not be broken. As the war dragged on, it became clear that humanity was not merely surviving, they were winning. Their unconventional tactics, relentless adaptability, and strategic brilliance had brought the once mighty Galactic Council to a standstill. What was once considered an inevitable human defeat had transformed into a nightmare for the Council's forces, as every engagement ended in losses they could not afford. The Council, now fully aware that this was not a war they could win through sheer numbers or brute force, began to reconsider their approach. But humanity, having learned from centuries of conflict, was already several steps ahead. They had transitioned from defense to offense, and the Council's forces were no longer the hunters but the hunted. 
humanity's counteroffensive came swiftly and decisively. Their fleets, once small and outnumbered, had grown in both power and sophistication. Human engineers had adapted captured council technology, creating new hybrid ships that combined the durability and firepower of the council's vessels with the speed and ingenuity of human designs. These new ships became the spearhead of humanity's assault, striking deep into council-controlled space. One by one, key council outposts fell to the human onslaught. But instead of engaging in long, drawn-out battles, humanity focused on strategic precision. Their strikes were devastatingly efficient, targeting vital infrastructure, communications hubs, and supply depots. Each strike crippled the council's ability to coordinate their forces, leaving them vulnerable and isolated. In some instances, entire fleets were left stranded without resupply, forced to retreat or face destruction at the hands of human forces. As humanity continued their advance, the psychological toll on the council became undeniable. The idea that a younger, smaller species could bring the most powerful coalition in the galaxy to its knees was unthinkable, yet that was precisely what was happening. Council leaders who had once mocked humanity's audacity now found themselves scrambling for answers, desperately trying to hold on to their power. But humanity didn't relent. They had learned long ago that the only way to secure their future was to push forward, to keep their enemies off balance and never give them a chance to recover. Every victory emboldened their forces, every successful operation deepened their resolve. For humans, this war wasn't just about survival. It was about proving, once and for all, that they belonged in the galaxy as equals, not as subordinates. The tide of the war began to shift irrevocably in humanity's favor when they launched a daring assault on one of the Council's central command stations. This station, located deep in what was once considered impenetrable Council territory, controlled much of the Council's military logistics. The idea of striking it seemed impossible, but humanity had always thrived on the impossible. Using their advanced stealth technologies and superior knowledge of the Council's tactical patterns, human forces managed to bypass the station's defenses. The assault was swift and overwhelming. Within hours, the command station, which had been responsible for coordinating much of the Council's war effort, was in human hands. The shockwaves from this victory were felt across the galaxy. Without the station's central command, the Council's forces were thrown into disarray, their remaining fleets forced to operate independently, and with far less cohesion. The loss of the station marked the beginning of the end for the Council's war effort. Desperation set in among their leadership. Their fleets, once so powerful and feared, were now scattered and demoralized. The Council had underestimated humanity from the beginning, and now they were paying the ultimate price. Humanity, however, did not let up. They knew the war was far from over, and their leaders understood that to secure peace, they had to ensure the Council could never pose a threat again. As the Council retreated, humanity pressed the advantage. Their ships continued to strike deep into Council space targeting not just military installations but also the industrial and political centers that supported the Council's war machine. On the diplomatic front, humanity's position had also shifted. Species that had once remained neutral or aligned with the Council now saw the writing on the wall. The Council was crumbling, and humanity was rising. Quietly, and in some cases openly, these species began to reach out to humanity, offering support, alliances, and in some cases, even military aid. The galaxy, once united under the Council's banner, was beginning to fracture, and humanity was at the center of this new order. For the Council, the final blow came not in the form of a massive battle, but in the realization that their hold on the galaxy was slipping away. Their forces, stretched too thin and suffering from internal dissent, could no longer muster a coordinated defense. The once unshakable unity of the Council was crumbling with member species questioning whether they should continue a war they no longer believed they could win. Humanity, sensing the Council's weakness, made their next move. Instead of pushing for total annihilation, they offered terms of surrender. These terms, while not generous, were not as brutal as the Council had feared. Humanity demanded the withdrawal of Council forces from all human colonies, the recognition of humanity's sovereignty, and most importantly, 
the dissolution of the Council's military capabilities. The Council, broken desperate, had no choice but to accept. After years of war, they had been brought to their knees by a species they had once dismissed as a minor threat. The formal surrender was signed on a neutral world, with human and council representatives present. It was a moment of immense significance, the end of a three thousand year era of peace, and the beginning of a new age, one in which humanity stood as a dominant force in the galaxy. But for humanity, this was not the end. They knew that peace, like war, was fragile. They had fought for their right to exist, for their right to chart their own course in the galaxy, but they also understood that the galaxy was a place of constant change. New challenges would arise, new threats would emerge, and humanity would have to remain vigilant. In the aftermath of the war, humanity began to rebuild. They turned their attention to fortifying their colonies, strengthening their alliances, and ensuring that they would never again be caught off guard by the whims of a distant council. Their leaders, now more experienced than ever, looked toward the future with cautious optimism. The war had been brutal, but it had forged a stronger, more united humanity, one that was ready to face whatever came next. And as the council faded into history, humanity stood tall, not as conquerors, but as survivors, determined to thrive in a galaxy that had once sought to control them. They had fought for their place, and now they had earned it. The galaxy, forever changed by the conflict, looked on with both awe and apprehension. The council's reign was over, but humanity's journey had just begun.